Hello, hello. Hello. We, looks like we uh, increasing number count. People are excited for this one. Um, all right, I'm gonna get out of the way. Everyone's seen enough of me. Uh, we're gonna let Santiago do a lot of uh, a lot of the talking here, um, and that's it. Yes. Thank you, Minx. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming, having this conversation about the deep web ecosystem, and the centralized physical networks. Um, I'm going to start by introducing myself, and then we'll introduce the panel. So um, my name is Santiago. I am a developer from uh, Montreal, Canada. I'm kind of working uh, a bit with the uh, Canadian handshake ecosystem and trying to also get involved with the Argentinian ecosystem. So let's start by introducing the panel today. Um, we'll start with, with you, Stephen. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, my name is Stephen Mackey. Uh, I'm the founder of Momentum Capital. I've been around the Handshake uh, community since, I guess, before it's like a proper inception. Um, a decent personality around, used to build a lot more stuff in and around culture to the space, but got a little bit busy uh, with more real life circumstances. But I look forward to being with Handshake as it kind of enters its next step of maturity. Yes, of course, you've been on Handshake since day one, Steven. So we are considered a true OG in the community. Thank you for joining us once again at, at HandyCon. Um, next, um, we're joined by Corey, the Corey Hero, who is the project leader of, uh, and co-founder of MaxQ. So, Corey? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, really amazing just to, you know, really grow into uh, Handshake's community. You guys have an amazing community, which is just full of energy, full of open you know, open development, open, uh, you know, creativity. So I'm just uh, grateful to be here amongst OGs and uh, want to talk about how we're trying to integrate, you know, Handshake into our ecosystem. So it just goes through the window of a browser into the, the billions of users in the world. So um, I'm just glad to, uh, to help build that with everybody. Thank you. We are also happy and excited to have David Wittok, um from uh, Influx Technologies. So welcome. Good afternoon, um, out of sunny Manitoba today. I am the uh, Chief Business Officer for Flux. I'm getting a lot of feedback here. I'm not sure if that's uh, on my end. Um, but yeah, I'm um, excited to be here. Um, I'm learning about Handshake as I go. I've, uh, we've been working with Handshake on a couple projects already ourselves uh, in our decentralized uh, offering. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to be here and uh, happy to talk about Web3 and, and, and Deepin and all that fun stuff. Super. And then uh, finally, we also have Matthew Schutte, uh, Director of Business Development at Holochain. Uh, welcome, Matthew. Thanks, Santiago. Yeah, uh, I'm calling in from Puerto Rico, where I live. And uh, I do work for Holochain, but I'm also here hoping to share a little bit about D-Web Camp, which is a, a wonderful gathering in Northern California every year. And uh, I can walk, dive into that more in a little bit. Big, thank you. Big, so fan of, big fan of D Web Camp here, by the way. I think I went to y'all's yeah. most one back in like 2021, but yeah, love it out there. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you, Matthew. So, um, this is more than just a conversation. Uh, we know that there are like two worldviews colliding right now this idea of centralization, decentralization, and that broader collision is just beginning to be felt all around the world. Today, we're going to be talking about the decentralization spectrum. I could not think of a better panel than the, the panel that we have in today. Um, I have prepared some questions for our panel. And then uh, for people who would like to ask questions, there is the Q&A uh, &A section on the right-hand side. Uh, please ask your question. And at the end of the panel, we're going to be doing the Q&A. So um, I would like to start with you, Stephen, um, ask you today, about decentralization in general. So could you tell us a bit about your basic framework? What is your view about decentralization? Why is it important? And what role does Handshake play? Yeah, I guess in the overarching theme of like crypto as a whole, right? Decentralization has been a, 
a kind of a kind of a meme in and like of itself, mostly because a lot of people don't necessarily understand like network topologies, right? The difference between a network that's distributed and is still resilient and one that is fault tolerant and like wholly like decentralized, right? So, um, you know, I won't go into a whole just, you know, this, you know, discussion on what exactly is decentralization, but it's kind of the core understanding is that as far as uh, the crypto ecosystem goes, you know, we first came with decentralized monetary peer to peer money systems like with Bitcoin. And then what followed was smart contracting ecosystems like like with Ethereum. And so once we had the ability to be able to have novel computation and, you know, scripts and contracts on top of like decentralized money, we kind of had two main pillars to like hold up the idea of like what else could be decentralized. So, you know, you had the monetary like subsidization of uh, the growth of the Ethereum asset, the monetary subsidization and the growth of the Bitcoin asset, which itself is, you know, a very complex code base. And then those, both of those assets provided the incentives um, for people with the intent to build more decentralized services and protocols on top of additional layers to come in. So, you know, we've seen novel peer-to-peer -peer money systems like Lightning being built on the Bitcoin side. We've seen you know, in interesting layer two, optimism, roll-ups, NFTs, all this cool stuff come to Ethereum. And then after a long enough time of elongated like R&D uh, and, you know, money spent on very smart people on nights and weekends, there comes a time for, you know, deeper levels of experimentation. So decentralized compute, um, decentralized like uh, um, uh but messaging, um, decentralized like governance, all these other sort of different aspects where we sort of thought, well, if we can get people and coordinate them together uh, without like a, a main centralized authority, what else can come from from that in order to build like a more enmeshed protocol ecosystem? Uh, and Handshake being one of kind of the, I guess, one of the mainstays of that with, you know, decentralized like root network, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 root certificate. Uh, and so that allowing, you know, the additional like permutation of, of more and more decentralized like uh, network services on top of the handshake network itself. And, you know, we've got we've got other people that are building deep in stuff. It seems that these memes sort of just evolve over time. So deep in decentralized, uh, you know, public infrastructure before we were calling it the D web. In some instances, it's called like Web3. But really, it's just an overarching way to kind of understand that there's different protocols that need to be built if we're going to, you know, more democratize like the Internet infrastructure like of the world. Uh, and we're going to need to do it step by step piecewise to figure out which parts are most resilient and which architectures are the most beneficial. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so Stephen gave it like a very general overview of decentralization, many topics here. And my next question is for, for you, Matthew. So I know you're involved with the webcam and I was wondering if you could tell the audience a bit about what the webcam is, what kind of topics uh, are being covered and why are you, why do you think decentralization is important? Sure. So DWebCamp has been, it started out as a conference um, hosted originally at the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive are the main organizing um, support group, really. Uh, and then after a couple of iterations as a conference, the organizers realized this would be better if we actually get people spending time together, not just in conference halls, but like camping, <laughs> like literally eating and showering next to each other and sleeping and, you know, all night, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and we've done three or four of those camping uh, events now. Um, and they are phenomenal. Uh, it's usually about 500 or so people. They currently are held in the woods up in Northern California in Mendocino County at a place called Camp Navarro. Um, if you go to dwebcamp.org, you can get to their website. It's, this year, it's going to be held August 7th through 11th, so that should be nice and, and warm. Good time to be in California. Uh, but who goes? It's everybody from like brand new folks who are still in high school or maybe even junior high that are like, oh my goodness, we've got an idea for a thing to like old crypto hands like Juan Benet from IPFS and Filecoin to Tim Berners-Lee, the 
inventor of the World Wide Web, to Vint Cerf, the co-author of TCP IP, literally like the father of the internet, right? So you have this incredible mix of people from junior high to the OGs of the internet that come together and hang out. And anybody who's participating can apply to speak and present. And in addition, there's a fair bit of on the fly emerging events that happen where people go, hey, I want to host a session on this, or we want to play Frisbee tag or whatever. Um, and you have people from North America, Europe, South America, Africa, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, East Asia, Australasia, the whole world of people that are interested in various aspects of decentralization, peer to peer, but most importantly, ways in which technology can empower individuals and communities to hopefully help us solve our, our biggest, most challenging problems. All those folks come together for, you know, a brief five or so days in the woods of Northern California. So that's that's my my quick pitch. Sounds good. Thank you, Matthew. One of the important pillars of decentralization, I think, is this idea of data ownership and privacy. So this next question goes for Kari. Uh, Kari, could you tell us about why it was important for Musk to adopt Handshake and why is privacy important? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, someone, I think it was A16Z put, uh, put or whoever created the Web3 sort of slogan, like read, write, and own, right? So Web2, we're coming from this read and write. Um, data siloed everywhere. It's harvested. It's monetized. It's tracked. You know, so you, along that way, you lose a lot of privacy of of being a user online. We're now we're moving into this Web three. I mean, Stephen um, put a very good description of how we've evolved through decentralization of technology and blockchain. And now we see that we've got these pillars of Web three. We've got D storage with IPFS. We've got D messaging. Um, I see Web uh, Web four, which is what uh, one of the the guy said in the other, I forget his name because there's so many great speakers, but you know how Handshake lives in this web four, which is like more decentralized from the gatekeepers we have now, where Handshake operates as a protocol controlled name service, you know, where, where websites are in its own root domain that is not controlled by people, right? It's controlled by technology. So to get that all to piece together in a private experience that respects the user we have to have that through what most people use now in some ways as a browser. That's the window to the world. So you've got these pillars of decentralization, these pillars of D-Web, which is stuff, like I said, storage, D-storage, D-messaging. Um, that D-Web whole framework has to operate in a way where users can interact with it. And not just devs building for devs or protocols building a, a tool stack. Yes, that's important. But the there has to be a product for the users, right? Because everyone... We're all super love the tech. There's people that just want to use it and they don't really care how it's made. They just want to hop in that Lambo and go as fast as they can. They don't care about the engineering inside the engine and all the stuff that's gone into that. And the millions and millions of dollars and hours of research and R&D and experimenting. They just want to use the cool stuff. So what we tried to put together at Mask, uh, which I'll talk about later in our session, is um, yeah, just we, how we've curated that experience how we've tried to um, foster that ethos that we believe we have in our vision that is so so loud and proud and alive at Handshake is that you need that centralization as a base and build that up, you know, from the protocol up and curate that experience so users can come in, use it, enjoy it, um, interact with it, build on it. Um, and that's what we've tried to do, but keeping privacy by default, right? So when you hop in, you know, it's not leaking your information anywhere online. There's no monetization of your data for ads. There's no gatekeepers that are trying to track you and and then make a buck. You know, it's like if you really read, write, and own your data, that means you got to read, write, and own your personal information and privacy. That's kind of goes hand in hand with that. So I think we kind of, in that way, we've curated the experience to give that value or preserve that value back into what the users are doing, keep it with them. And of course, if you interact with something and you want to share something, whether it's a message, whether it's a sign up for an account, and you as a user choose to move that information somewhere else, that you can retain as much value as you can um, in that whole decentralized space. So, you know, we hope to keep building that. And, um, 
We've we're, our goal is to integrate Handshake as deeply as we can into the browser, so everyone and ev anyone and everywhere can use the technology and, and use that uh, the Handshake protocol. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think one of important aspect uh, besides privacy is this idea that, that the network needs to be scalable. And this also this huge topic of being uh, interoperable, right? So this question goes for Davy. Um, so Flask is the largest fully decentralized cloud computing network. And as offerings continue to grow, do you foresee scalability in the future? How do you see that? Like, do you see technology continue to depend on legacy infrastructure? Or how do you see um, this playing out as technology continues to evolve? Well, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's good to take a step back here, actually. I love what Corey's saying. I love what Steven said. Um, it, it, there's a lot of uh, things that Web3 is, and infrastructure is a big play in that. Scalability is definitely a big play in that as well. Um, I actually had a, a big meeting with a old Web1 provider, um, the guys who originally created uh, Linux for enterprises back in the day with Novell and, and later on SUSE. And I got the biggest compliment for Flux that I ever could get. Um, and the, the compliments, compliment was as follows. Basically, it was everybody's moving away from their data centers that are local or even on-prem uh, and every company. And they're all moving to the big-ass data centers, sorry for my language. Uh, but basically, if you think about it, an Amazon, a Google, uh, they're basically just really just large, large, large facilities, uh, very centralized. And he's like, you guys actually build an actual cloud solution, not the massive data center solution. And that's what we're going for. We're literally trying to have Internet 2.0 created, where basically we go back to the roots of the Internet, where you literally had peer-to-peer -peer traffic, peer-to-peer -peer communication, peer-to-peer -peer websites, all of that fun stuff. And how do we do that? We literally have it all tied to the blockchain. So we are a proof of work chain. And, and the way we operate is, is everybody can participate. You have a Raspberry Pi laying around, you can hook it up to the network and you can be a provider for, for websites or for APIs or, or even a game server if, if it's not too hard. That's the, the, that's the scalability. We go from the Raspberry Pis, an older computer that you have at home, and we go all the way to the data centers that people are leaving at this point. And why are we doing that? Because that's actually the strength of the internet. That basically creates an actual decentralized platform that cannot be taken down with one data center going down. That's the strength. If you think about it, the internet at this point is getting so centralized, so dependent on these big three, that it's become very scary that it doesn't take much to take away half your country and, and take and rob them from their 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 news, their 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 entertainment, their way to operate, to even shop. Um, order food, see a doctor at this point, because all of that goes through these big data centers. We had a perfect example uh, last week with Amazon struggling. Right? Facebook goes down, uh, hospitals were unavailable. That's scary. Um, I'm not saying that we're the one and true solution here. I'm actually uh, even advocating for an integration between Web 2 and Web 3. Um, I think that's how we scale. It's not just being dependent on the big ones but everybody providing their own compute power whenever they can, that guarantees us uh, a true decentralized platform. Tie that in with projects like what Corey's working on, what Steven working on, what Matthew is preaching with camping and, and, and bringing people together that way. That's literally what we're trying to perform here is, is that we make it easy, usable, inexpensive for everybody to utilize. If you have an idea, you want to put it on the website, just, Drop it up. Hey, what was it? I, I think my, my son hosted something for a few flux for an entire year. That's $2. Uh, I don't think you can find that anywhere else. Um, but I, I do hear um, there's a big concern with Web3. And the biggest concern that we're all trying to face, and, and Corey actually touched on it as well, is usability. Being able to use it easily. Um, I'll quote Dan, who normally does these type of things. But Dan always says, like, if I go to an ATM or my wife goes to the ATM, she plops in the, the credit card, does her thing, gets her money, walks out. She doesn't care what happened in the background. She doesn't care all the handshaking, all the, the transfers that had to happen, the, the, the software, the, the hardware, all involved. They don't care. They just want it easy. 
Flux has done that now as well. We made it easy and credit card, all that fun stuff. You, you don't need to go purchase Flux to do your thing. Uh, it still settles for Flux on the chain, but we took care of that back end. And I love to see how we can utilize Handshake in that way as well. Um, we've, uh, we've experimented with it as well a couple times um, where we try and integrate the things, uh, offer uh, websites via Handshake DNS. Yeah, it's pretty cool the, the way it all operates at this point. And I think that's going to be the strength going forward having the option to have a people run type of internet, not just a corporate one. That's a great I one, uh, Davey. Um, people talk about like applications as, where do we see applications of decentralized technologies? I think one, one a great example that I found is uh, DexGrid, which is a platform for bootstrapping and managing community microgrids, energy management to create distributed marketplaces for clean energy. And this company does distributed uh, green energy resources in Puerto Rico. And this question goes for, for Steven. Um, I found this to be a good application that is uh, implementing decentralized principles and technologies for the energy sector. How do you see uh, applications such as this one in the energy sector benefit communities with affordable and sustainable electricity as an application of of decentralization. Yeah, um, those Dex guys, Dex grid guys have been on, uh, working on that for quite a few years. So, um, you know, I constantly get the updates and talk to the founders there in like Puerto Rico. And what I've found is even when you have a, like a novel idea, like decentralized microgrids or the incentivization of that, because um, Dex grid itself doesn't necessarily use uh, any crypto payments or anything in it anywhere, um, not as of yet. Um, but the general idea for DexGrid was, you know, if, if how do you incentivize uh, clean energy like microgrids if one of the main issues is the cost of the infrastructure like necessary? So in, in this case, um, you know, hydro, hydro, hydroelectric power, um, wind, uh, solar, in this case on the island of Puerto Rico, mostly solar. And so effectively you have, you know, a lot of wealthier individuals that are on Puerto Rico that are more resilient against, you know, hurricanes, you know, the natural disasters because they have, you know, backup power generators, um, solar systems, etc. cetera. Um, but there is no way to effectively get the rest of that uh, excess energy uh, onto the grid to other individuals in times of emergencies, unless you have a direct partnership with the individuals that maintain that infrastructure. So, you know, you're not just going to go to, you know, a utility company and say, hey, we're building a protocol. If you guys work with us, we can help you, like, you know, enable more microgrids on the island. First thing you would need to do is you would need to can you would need to incentivize the individuals that already have that energy and give them some basic infrastructure that basically gives you leverage to go to the utility companies and say, hey, we've already done steps one and two. Uh, you know, if we can get you guys to like tap into here and help us, then we can provide more critical infrastructure to like, you know, the rest of the island and, and like in the time of emergencies. And the idea is that over time, if more of these types of concepts proliferated, not at least in that island and, and, and a lot of the things sometimes that we invest into are very, very early stage, like ideas that sometimes can verge on the end of being an experiment. Um, but, you know, that's just kind of the nature of like taking risks. So. You know, it's it's really a matter of uh, learning ways to use decentralization, um, financial incentives to create leverage so that those that provide additional utility and infrastructure have a reason to look at it. Great example is something like Bitcoin as a peer to peer, you know, money transfer system. It grew to be as mature as it was, wasn't going anywhere. Exchanges popped up, a whole new, you know, mining hardware ecosystem popped up behind it. Um, you know, it proved this resiliency time and time again to the point that now we have ETFs. So, you know, basically it's like if the whole concept of if you build it, like they will come. Um, but if you build it and you provide them incentives to also come as a like kind of like a trail of bread, then hopefully you can get people to if you if not just looking at your protocol and and, and using it or at least going to the, back to the, the, the drawing book and saying, how can we change or leverage the infrastructure that we already have? Or how can we take advantage of these new technologies uh, in order to, you know, blend them and upgrade ourselves for like the 21st century? Uh, and so there are right ways to do that, wrong ways to do that. You have to dig into like the legacy aspect of whatever that existing like ecosystem is. There's always some regulatory reason why certain things haven't been tried before. 
Uh, and so like anything in crypto, you've, you've got to come to these things with a lot of patience uh, and the expectation to be proven wrong sometimes, which is like totally OK. Um, but when it comes to something like, you know, people's you know resilience in times of emergencies and, and being sort of like life saving like circumstances, um, then it, it's it's even more important for us to do these types of things, um, not just with money, not just with smart contracts and you know that type of stuff. Like when when we start blending things into the real world, there's a lot more real world consequences outside of building like you know mining data mining data data centers. Excuse me. So um, they have to be taken with a, you know, a lot more patience than usual, uh, and usually it requires or what I've I've seen uh, an older founder, older developers of those things that have like been in the world existing as adults and realize that laws, rules and the rule of law and regulation exist for a reason. And it's best to like work in tandem with those regulators as opposed to like working in opposition of them. Thank you, Steven. And Matthew, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Like, how is the webcam um, sort of uh, teaching people about decentralization, the benefits of this, I mean, this idea of distributed benefits, mutual respect, transparency, and technology for human agencies. So could you tell us more about how do you see these being applied in, in, in communities? Sure. I mean, well, first off, I live in Puerto Rico. Uh, Stephen was bang on <laughs> about, about his assessment of what's going on here. It's pretty regular that we, we actually do have power outages, even when there's not a storm, right? The grid is pretty fragile. Uh, and yeah, people who are wealthier, they get solar and they get battery systems and folks who are not, they don't. And so when the grid goes down or portions of the grid go down, only the people who are wealthiest uh, are able to, to actually have power and refrigeration and you know all the other things that we, that we kind of need to, to make things work. Um, at D-WebCamp, there's not a lot of teaching going on. It's mostly co-exploration. So you do have people who come and share what they're up to, but a lot of what's happening there is people cross-pollinating, connecting, right? A little bit like the speakers are getting to do here and like some of the people who are in the audience are getting to do in some of the networking sessions, et cetera, right? Um, but there's a lot of co-learning. I'll, sh I'll share from, from the, the day job uh, side of things. I work on a project called Holochain. Sounds like a blockchain, not a blockchain. It's a framework for building fully peer-to-peer -peer applications. There is no one big Holochain. There's no mining. There's no staking. If you build a Holochain application and run it with your friends or family or business, we might not ever even know that it exists, right? It's just a way to be able to run an application, set a, 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 a set of rules, maybe membranes, who's allowed to join, that kind of things. What is the game we're playing? Are we playing chess or are we playing Twitter? Or are we playing something like Airbnb, right? And enable that community actually run that together, right? Um, and for us, the, the real vision, the goal there wasn't just about ownership, and it wasn't just about privacy, though those things are important to us as well, but it was really about evolutionary capacity that we believe it's really critical that people be able to go, hey, I wanna try this and not have to have it make sense for somebody else's business model in order for them to be able to communicate in that way, right? We don't have a business model ourselves for Holochain. There's no revenue stream there. But similar to Davey and what they're doing with Flux, we set up a separate business offering that itself makes use of Holochain called Holo Host. And we released an ERC-20 token and we raised millions of dollars. And now it's, you know, $700 million market cap or whatever, right? And that is decentralized physical infrastructure. It's web hosting, peer-to-peer, -peer, right? What we're looking at now, we're, we're planning to launch in the next few months, right? We've promised we'll be launching by the end of June. But that's been seven years in the, in the works, right? Like distributed systems are hard. Davey will tell you, Steve will tell you, Cowrie will tell you, like this stuff is not easy. These distributed, much harder than centralized systems. But when you get it right, there's potential magic there. And for us, we're really trying to make a change in the world. And we're also looking for the opportunities to partner with others who are trying to do so as well. So at the moment, we're really interested in talking to other DPIN project, projects, other decentralized physical infrastructure projects, 
where there might be benefits for collaboration. We're also really interested in talking to folks like the people in the in in this community who are really interested in namespaces, whether those are global or non-global namespaces. Would love to chat with folks about that. So I'll share my email address in the chat. If there's anybody who wants to talk about any of those things, feel free to ping me and we can gab. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, my next question goes for uh, Corey. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, your view on the implementation and accessibility of these technologies to the general public. We know Musk recently integrated Handshake. What is your vision on borderless browsing? Yeah, no, borderless browsing is is really one of our key messages um, from Mask, where the idea and the vision is that anyone and everyone in the world can access the same, pretty much the same information that anyone else living in a different place can can access. So, you know, you can't have decentralization where one part of the world can access all of it permissionlessly, and the other half of the world has gatekeepers, has censorship, has, you know, authoritative uh, regimes who are oppressing the average person in their country. And that exists so much in the world. Uh, it has fragmented a lot of things, including innovation, adoption. And, uh, you know, all of us who've been in many cycles, you know, we kind of joke, oh, India's banned crypto again, guys. Oh, China's banned crypto again, guys. You know, like it's just a cycle of, of you know, kind of like trying to pressurize adoption and see how much control can still be done right so our vision for you know adopting um you, sorry our vision for user adoption has to start with making things simple and the biggest part of the mask browser is that we want it to be open to everybody so anyone and everyone can download the browser we're going to we host uh, all our versions on ipfs as well so really no matter where you live you can download it um, you can use it, and it's it's largely permissionless. Uh, but but what's hidden behind the scenes is within the browser, it does kind of operate. I feel like we're a step into uh, we're a step in Web three, and we're a step in sort of the deep end area where the browser will act as a node on the network as well. So if you want to serve the network, you're sharing your bandwidth with others, and in that borderless browsing sense, you're sharing your freedom because. You know, there's not, well, we joke around freedom, quote unquote, right? There's always degrees of freedom. But in a lot of the Western world, there's not a lot of restriction online. You can go to various sites. You can go to Google, YouTube, Facebook, Meta, whatever they call it now, uh, everything, you know, it, it relatively unrestricted. And then you've got countries where they, they don't have access to any of that. Uh, you know, you've got massive countries like Russia. They ban Twitter and, and it's people have to use VPN as a way of life. Now users can be part of the network and give back that freedom to others. And there's an incentive model there. You know, Stephen and Davey both said it very well. You need incentives in a protocol for users to go there and providers to go there and build that infrastructure. Um, so all those are pieces of mask. And, uh, you know, we feel like, you know, that vision is so strong that, that it, it almost promotes itself. Everyone wants to be part of something great. Everyone wants to, you know, moralistically, most people want to give as well as receive. So if you have that built right, the users will come. Um, it's that trail of breadcrumbs, you know, that Stephen said really well. And uh, we hope that, you know, putting it in the form of a browser like we have that delivers that borderless browsing will just let the next million users, you know, come into the space and without knowing a lot of technical things, be able to contribute to those protocols. And of course, Handshake, you know, to end off with where that sits, you know, the more people that adopt and use Handshake as a naming space, a uh, naming service, the more the technology can grow, the more the protocol can grow. It's it, it, it A big thing is about the domain marketplace, which is amazing and people can control it. It's censorship resistant, which is the key to all of us. But at the same time, users need to, to be able to use it. So we hope that having that front and center in the browser where it's native means that everyone can use it. And so that's why this partnership is so important for us. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, um, Corey. So, Davey, Corey just mentioned one of the biggest points maybe that we hear in the media today, this idea of content restriction, censorship-resistant technologies. Um, we, we know Flux recently announced the launching of WordPress on the Flux platform. Could you mm -hmm. tell us why this is important? Do you really think this is the future of journalism? 
Oh, uh, is that a question? Uh, Santiago, you're, you're in Canada, right? Uh, we have yeah. more. We are I, I'm, I'm not going to go political here, here, but but um, I see things happening here, even in, in, in a Western country, where I thought that Canada was one of the most liberal countries out there. Um, it's scary the way we see things evolve at the moment. Um, so I'm happy that I see not just Flux creating uh, platforms for hosting. Um, that by itself, by the way, is decentralization, right? Having other folks create similar type of offerings. Um, but yes, WordPress helps with that. WordPress uh, is, is an easy to use website builder um, with a ton of plugins, love them or hate them. Um, they, they can do some uh, fun stuff to your websites. Uh, but yes, so Flux has a fully decentralized version of WordPress. So we literally took a 20 year old software that is built to run on a single server, maybe two if you put your database on a separate server. Uh, but that was kind of the intention, easy to set up and get going. So we, we created it now or we created it a little bit. Uh, it's still the original WordPress. It's still, you can update the WordPress, all that fun stuff, all the plugins, but we made it uh, so that it's decentralized. How does that work? Well, basically your nodes, and because every instance of an application on Flux has three instances. So even if, let's say, something happens on the West Coast, your node goes down there, well, there's two other ones running ready to go and, and, and keep your website online. That's also important to understand that if a, a government, wherever you're hosting your WordPress, wants to start attacking your site or even blocks you from uh, running it, um, it just moves around. They can't stop it. That's the beauty of it. Um, it just transitions around the blockchain will notify uh, another node hey i'm supposed to have three nodes running here uh, one went down let's spin an up uh, another one and it's actually a little overzealous because it actually will spawn two or three uh, extra nodes just to make sure nothing bad's happening because uh, we don't know what's going on right somebody might just lose power somebody might just lose internet uh, or somebody might literally actively try and, and block somebody from accessing a website um, that's important that we nurture that uh, behavior. That goes for WordPress, but that goes for any other application. Even your game servers that you run on the on the network, they will move around if people do nefarious things towards it or have bad intentions or just a government trying to block something. Um, and yeah, it is it is very important to, to, to have that. Um, I do want to touch on a couple other things because there's a really good conversations here and we're not really conversation. I, it's It's a very... Monot uh, very monotone conversation here, but I love what Stephen was saying about the the microgrids. I'm actually getting the same requests from folks to to help build out Flux in a similar way. I know for uh, for sure that somebody out there already, because uh, he showed me, he has a small I/O uh, little box um, that's running on 12 volts, running a Cumulus server, for instance linked to Starlink, so he's completely off the grid with this machine. So that's a node that's completely decentralized running on solar power. Um, that, that to me is, is awesome. Um, and I wanted to see more of that. I know I have one of my guys who's working very actively with the African uh, community as well, where IT is still in its infant stages, especially outside of the cities. Um, so we're working there as well to see if we can help there. Um, I have folks who are coming with ideas of negative carbon um, compute power. So where basically anything electricity used gets turned into a useful product. Um, I'm not going to disclose because it's a patent and I don't want to uh, stump uh, on, on their ideas. Uh, but it's, it's cool to see that people are really trying to find ideas. That said, I'm the older guy here, unfortunately. Um, I come out of the Web 1, Web 2 world. Uh, my background is medical IT, and I know all the hoops people have to jump through to get their ideas live. And Stephen is not wrong. And that's, that's the balance that we all uh, try to find here. It's fun to innovate. It's fun to create. It's fun to make very awesome ideas happen. But if the mainstream world is not ready for it, you're not going to get that adoption. So that's the balance that everybody on this panel is also fighting is how do we make it go to the next level without scaring everybody away from it? Um, and I think 
uh, that's what we're all trying to do here. And that's, that's literally going to drive Web3. It's taking a step back sometimes, realize that we've gone a little too far. Let's take a step back, get the folks on board, and then move forward. Uh, that's going to be the, the way forward in my book. Steven, any response? Um, you know, I, I agree with the points that everyone else is, uh, you know, making here. I, I will, I will kind of lean on um, something what someone said in the chat though, which kind of like really, really kind of bodes well with the, this whole like idea and concept, which is just like when you deal with decentralized technologies that many different modular moving parts, especially to like you know aid in their actual decentralization. Like for a great handshake, perfect example. You have to understand DNS. You have to understand, you know, the root certificate authorities. You have to understand um, uh, blockchains themselves. Um, you have to understand those incentives there. Then the name auction system. Then, then there, there's so many different moving pieces that you might spend a weekend or nights and weekends. Immediately you get it because, like, okay, you, you were there for Bitcoin. You were there for Ethereum. But it's still going to take a quite a long time. And th th this is something I had to unfortunately accept. This was part of my thing of kind of like growing up too, from like that young mid twenties idealism of we can fix everything. The adults are just slow to I hit my thirties and I'm just like, Oh, okay. There's a rhyme and a reason for why these things are slow. Humans are humans. Um, you know, they take, they take time to like digest information, build trust in themselves and in their understanding of the technologies that, you know, they're trying to adopt. And that's just the nature of the business. You can provide incentives, um, you know, airdrops, you know, cool, unique like, opportunities. You know, we got oh, we got a soft fork. We've got the happening coming. All these new names, like that's great. But still, it's going to take time for people to grok these things. And you know, I've had similar situations even just earlier this morning. Half of like like growing up into is like growing and learning to like trust and accept that the knowledge that you are ingesting comes from a reliable source. And the integrity that you've built in yourself in that understanding can can withstand like you know people coming and challenging your ideas. Well, why is Handshake actually good for this? What makes it any different than Ancoin? What's it makes it any different than ENS? If you don't have a deep understanding in the technologies and you kind of like gone down the rabbit holes and you can't make those rebuttals, you're going to start to question yourself. And so until you can until you can you know work up against the, the, the uh, you know, friction of someone questioning your understanding, it's going to take time for you to feel comfortable in adopting something, which is what happened with regulators with Bitcoin, right? If you understood Bitcoin really early, you were like, oh, this is going nowhere. We're just going to sit on our hands, hold, and, you know, we're just, we're going to, we're going to make bank. And then year after year after year, cycle after cycle, we were proven right again until eventually we got an ETF. Like it took time for the regulators to say, there's only so much we can do. We either play along, we either play along in this game or we get like we get left behind. And sometimes that's like the last thing that pushes you over that, you know, kind of like, you know, adoption curve from like the early majority and into like kind of getting to, you know, like main mainstream adoption is the the surrender that you might not completely understand this technology, but enough people do that now you have to trust their decision making, which kind of comes with the whole idea of a you know common democracy. Right. Like you hope that the good, the good majority of people are acting in their best interest, even if you don't fully understand the implications as to why we're making these rules. So. So, yeah. So crypto as crypto has grown up. I've grown up and I've come to accept that certain things take time. Thank you. Here, here. That, that, absolutely. I, I, I've, I've, I've been a, a specialist on, on medical IT myself many times. And, and the amount of times I had to convince board and presidents and, and from hospitals to say, hey, this is the way forward. This is the best idea. And then you go like, no, 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 no. We're going to do that way. I, I gave an entire spiel why this was the best idea and why that one is not good. I gave you examples after examples. And still, it, it, it's not just crypto. It's, it, that's, that's, that's just human nature. I think uh, it, it happens in the regular day uh, IT business as well. And I'm sure with other types of uh, uh, decision makings. I've learned to listen. Um, myself at one point, uh, and, and if, if you have a specialist or somebody who is an expert at something, tend to listen. They they often know what they're talking about. Um, yeah. And and I'll just add to that. I I really appreciate both Davy and Cowry in terms of their strategy of how to bring about change. Right, Cowry going to where people already are, building browsers that actually can support, build a bridge to the new world. Don't ask everybody to cross some big chasm, like build the bridge. And Davey, hey, people know WordPress. They know how to use it. They like it. 
sweet, getting that on, on a decentralized infrastructure, huge win, right? Um, for, for us, that was really what Holo Host was about. We're building crazy new weird crypto tech, peer-to-peer -peer apps. But if you build your like peer-to-peer -peer version of Airbnb, you don't want only early geeky crypto tech adopters to be able to book a room, right? You want anybody to be able to book a room. So the real reason that we launched Holo Host wasn't just, hey, this will help us fund the larger ecosystem. It was also, oh, this builds a bridge to the existing world of regular people who are used to using web apps and traditional mobile apps, right? They don't have to have any idea. Like somebody was saying earlier about ATMs, they don't have to have any idea what's happening on the back end. That there's peer-to-peer -peer stuff or a, an incentivized, incentivization structure for host. Nope, that's all invisible. They got to book a room. That was what mattered. Mm -hmm. So yes, fully on board with both the simplifying, but also the meet people where they're at, right? That will help them migrate to a, to a new, different, hopefully better future. I agree. That sounds good. Here, here. Uh, we're going to close with you, Corey, before it's yours. Oh, wow. Um, I love being in these panels. I feel like, you know, sometimes when you're around lots of people smarter than you, you just, you come out of this feeling like, you know, you've learned and, and you're growing through the experience. Um, but I feel like what was super, super cool about just me really jumping into the Handshake community is stuff like this, these conferences where everyone can mingle with with like-minded people creating amazing things, but all have a very shared, you know, um, truly, you know, charitable vision for what it should look like in the future, being decentralized, being interoperable, being where, you know, anyone can build anything, you know, and, and use all the tooling there and have it open permissionless for everybody. Um, so I think, you know, just looking at the power of the stuff being built, the people here, um, looking at all these great ideas and then the human element of of collaborating with with other like-minded people. I mean, the future has never been brighter, but you know, as 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 some of the people said, you know, as you grow, you realize there's a lot of things in the world that can be solved um, in different ways. And uh, we just got to find our way to do it. So, you know, really looking forward to chatting with a lot of you after this session and, and contacting and, and touching base. So um, love chatting with you guys. Thank you for, for letting me close today. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to all the other speakers and events today. Thanks so much. You guys have done an amazing job with producing this event. I'm very impressed with pretty much everything. So thanks again to everybody. Thank you, everyone.